Thanks. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, yeah. session today on debating the hydrogen energy future. My name is Mike Bradshaw, and I'm a professor at the Warwick Business School. Um, and I'm a co-investigator on the unconventional hydrocarbons program uh, project called the UK Shale Gas Landscape. So today we have two, two excellent speakers who are probably known to everyone. I'm not going to, to, to spend time introducing at length Benjamin Sobakul and Indra Overland. Just to lay, lay out the ground rules for how this session is going to work, we've had many sessions of this kind. So first of all, can I ask you all to turn off your microphones and cameras? so that we don't get any interference during the presentations. So mics and, and, and cameras off, please. Uh, secondly, uh, can you please ask your questions through the chat function? And I will collate those and ask the questions on your behalf um, because we simply don't have the time to be using hands waving and all those other gestures. And we have quite a large number of people on, on the session. So just to remind you, cameras and mics off, ask the chat, ask through the chat section, and I will then ask the questions. Both speakers have 30 minutes allotted um, for them to give their presentation and answer any questions. If we have too many questions, which I expect we're likely to, we will also capture the, the narrative from the chat room and share that with the speakers and they can follow things up with you. So without further delay, it's my pleasure to ask Benjamin Sovacol to give his presentation on the hydrogen transition through a socio-technical lens. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here on this kind of very interesting topic, one that's kind of captivated energy analysts uh, for uh, for many years. It's been one of the always that of attention and, and insight. Um, and I think you can partly see why this this the U.S. Department of Energy. So it's actually an official federal government diagram, uh, which is always nice because you don't have copyright, so you can use them in your presentation. <laughs> but uh, what you can see is uh, look at all of the ways they're new that hydrogen to different energy okay. systems. Provide uh, heating. It can provide mobility through vehicles. It can help industrial process. It can help upgrade oil and biomass, some of the other industrial applications, uh, things like metals refining, and even a kind of uh, the ability to decarbonize electricity. So a kind of a hydrogen has been called by some the forever fuel, because it can do everything that we need uh, a versatile fuel or system to do. Take a look at some of our <coughs> measured assessments of hydrogen. This comes from here in the UK. This is the uh, Committee on Climate Change. So pretty rigorous. They're, they're talking about here are the ways that the U can decarbonize its industry and hydrogen is in the middle. As some feedstocks we made to help us decarbonize things like gas, oil, coal, iron, in fact, it's one of only three energy sources on this diagram, along with electricity and bioenergy, hopefully with CCS, and then efficiency and, and material efficiency being a potential fourth fuel, depending on how you count for efficiency. So I think no matter what you look at, hydrogen has legitimately claimed a space on our agenda for the next major energy system. Uh, and part of maybe why has to do with some of the compelling narratives or cultural discourses behind hydrogen. So we, in this book here, looked at visions across many different energy systems, including clean coal, including nuclear power, including renewables. Uh, and this just shows you in the chapter on hydrogen. We did a of the mass media. So publications like Newsweek, the New York Times, I think Business Week. And we also did, uh, formal content analysis, academic literature. These being published in Energy Policy, the International Journal of Hydrogen Energy, the Journal of Cleaner Production, and found within that literature, five very dominant narratives about the value and the promise of hydrogen, that hydrogen um, could enable us to kind of escape our environmental limits. It could be the fuel that we use. It's the post-Kyoto fuel. Uh, that enables us to meet our economic growth demands with very clean energy. We have others like President George Bush 
talking about how hydrogen could be the path to energy independence because you can make it with electricity, you can make it with gas, uh, you could then use it to insulate yourself theories of the globe. You have others talking about hydrogen and patriotism. It can provide jobs, competitiveness, innovation, industrial strategy. Even others that talk about how it can enable us to create so much energy, we start to as outer space, as energy that we can do with, kind of like fusion. And finally, those that talk of community energy, how hydrogen could be a way of furthering energy democratization, decentral, uh, that helps break the chains of major energy companies and gives power back to the communities. Jeremy Rifkin talks a lot about these themes. So obviously, hydrogen has a lot of technical potential and it has a very strong social infrastructure that is able to cap imaginations of lots of kids, engineers, investors. And that leads me to think that I, uh, this kind of socio-technical lens is very useful for how we think about hydrogen. It isn't just about fuel cells and pipelines uh, and feedstocks. It is a network that crosses all of the dimensions that you see here. Media discourses and culture, very specific end products and vehicles uh, to very different forms of infrastructure like uh, pyrolysis and electrolysis, uh, to very markets and user patterns, even things like how we maintain our hydrogen pipelines, how we set our policies, how financing systems get attuned to hydrogen. And I think the peril of this type of a system is if you only focus on one dimension, you obscure and miss all the other dimensions. If you only focus on the technical aspects, you miss the economic aspects, the social aspects, the cultural aspects. And conversely, if you're a social scientist who wants to only study the discourse of hydrogen, you also miss all the other material elements of what you need for a hydrogen system. And so I think that it's one of those areas that cries out for so high scale or multi-actor analysis that truly captures the complexity of what's at stake with the hydrogen transition. A final way of looking at it is it tells you all the things that need to change. If hydrogen were to become a dominant socio-technical system, you're going to have to align regulations, pipelines, industries, markets, users, products, and discourses together, which is a very arduous task that many energy systems haven't even achieved. And it's also one that only a handful of other fuels, coal, oil, and gas, have tended to achieve in our lifetime. This is quite nice. We have a project here at Sussex uh, with UCL called OSTET, Operationalizing Socio-Technical Transitions. This comes from Rachel and Neil Strakhan, where they're uh, um, hydrogen, its future is obviously, uh, it's not preordained. It's very contingent. It will depend on the choices we make, the branching pathways, the portfolios that we invest in. And I kind of like here, how they've mapped for us five very different hydrogen pathways, all which could be possible for the United Kingdom. From the kind of incremental pathway that's very easy, hydrogen supplements things, to a kind of moderate pathway of hydrogen starts to embed itself into industry and maybe other very specific processes, all the way to the very difficult one, hydrogen dominant source. And I think here is a very, nice chart that shows you that hydrogen's future is still iterative. We can choose which of these pathways hydrogen may take, both in the UK and, and in, in other countries. However, um, I'm also kind of reminded here in the UK, uh, we have done this before, as, as Yogi Berra once said uh, from the States, it's deja vu all over again. There has been a similar transition in a form of energy heat that the UK did uh, before many of you were born, where we did transition from town gas to natural gas, based largely on discoveries in the North Sea. And what's interesting is that this previous transition was not market driven. It wasn't kind of the markets you need to pull along. It was very much a government led, uh, star strong state, top down transition. The UK converted 40 million appliances across 14 million homes, almost homes, in about a decade. Um, and you can see that the transition was so successful that by 1977, 92% of the UK population had 
a gas grid connection. And this was driven by very much nationalized entities like gas council and area boards who then worked in a very top-down manner with municipalities and civil society groups and companies. You had companies like Shell and BP. I think there was a Miss 1970 campaign that showed the wonders of what gas could do. So interesting that we often forget that transitions are, can be state-led and they can also be very quick if they're given the right resources. And already we've done it here in the UK uh, where we already know about things like British culture uh, and the kind of business models and the suppliers and the infrastructure available. However, I think as we think through the promise and the potential blueprints for transitions, we should remember too that social acceptance of hydrogen is very low. So this comes from a survey that we've done this year funded by Horizon 2020, which is a European Commission project. And it wasn't about hydrogen, but the project was about low carbon heat. So in the project, we did a survey, and this is showing you the two top graphs, the UK data. And ironically, we had exactly 2,000 respondents because we just got, we got lucky as opposed to 2,001 or 1,999. But you can see when we asked people how they heat their home, I mean, look, 73.8%, of course, gas. Less than 1%, 0.8%, or to be more precise, 15, 15 respondents out of 2000 actually have hydrogen heat. Um, and when you then ask the UK respondents, how likely would they be to change to hydrogen if they were given an opportunity, you can see here only 6.4% said somewhat likely, only 3.7% said very likely, and you have far stronger responses, somewhat unlikely, very unlikely, or don't know. And in the bottom, we ran the survey in five countries. So we also ran it in Greece, Italy, Germany, and Sweden. You can see that hydrogen sits with oil for the least preferred option that people say they want if they are given a choice about where they'll get their heat from. Solar is number one at 32%. Gas is number two at 28%. Uh, and heat pumps are number three at 20%. So this shows you the scale of social knowledge and preferences that may need to be stimulated if we are going to see hydrogen play a more, a more dominant role. And then finally, I find this fascinating, again, not about hydrogen, but some of our other work has been about energy literacy. How much do people know about energy production, energy consumption, energy prices, electricity prices? Uh, survey, not in the UK, but in Denmark, where we thought really, really literate, because Denmark is known for having very high taxes, very high energy prices. I think the most expensive electricity in the EU because of their taxation scheme, third most expensive prices for petrol. And of course, the Danes are known for being very environmentally progressive. Lots of vegans, lots of people with organic food, supporting wind energy, supporting car sharing. So we were quite shocked uh, when we asked them basic questions about their literacy, it was really, really low. And we also drew from an American survey that had been done earlier. And you can see here in the bottom right percent, only 12% of Americans pass a basic energy literacy test. And only 14%, so just two more percentage points, pass the Danish test. And sorry, I am an American, so I still think in terms of A's, A, B, and C, the top grades. Um, only 1% of Americans would actually get a, a, a which is the best score, uh, on a literacy test and only 4% of Danes. So again, it starts to really question. Uh, and also when you ask the consumers how much they think they know about energy, they all rate themselves as knowledgeable or very knowledgeable. So they are arrogant. They overestimate their own knowledge and underestimate what they don't know, which is a very dealing with education. Uh, and so I think to conclude my last slide, uh, hydrogen, I think, has a lot of potential. It's very good we're here to debate the future. I think its future uh, holds a lot of promise because it is one of those energy sources that can cut across dimensions, cut across carriers, cut across being supported, buttressed, a very strong social discourses about the things hydrogen could do us, independence, competitiveness, jobs, uh, patriotism. I think we have to also remember that a hydrogen transition, though, isn't just technical. And the about social infrastructure, 
regulations, financing flows, systems of knowledge and training, user practices, cultural meaning, advertising, symbols, all of those gender can shape the way that hydrogen goes, as well as very important political shifts. Is energy a commodity? Is energy a right? All of these will help shape the degree to which hydrogen may or may not compete. Here in the UK, I like this notion of these different branching points that kind of hydrogen is, is it's not yet determined. There's no determined pathway hydrogen will take. It will very much depend on the next five or 10 years and key decisions we make now to lock it in or to lock it out. I do still think that the previous transition here in the UK to town gas is a possible model, uh, although it's a, a heavy handed model that requires state involvement and centralization and kind of top down management. Uh, but that seems to be one pathway that we could engender a hydrogen economy. And finally, let's not forget the importance of social acceptance and knowledge, that it remains very low compared to other systems, especially solar or heat pumps. And this can be seen, I guess, two ways. On the one hand, it can be a barrier because you think people won't know enough. They won't be incentivized enough. They won't be willing to pay for hydrogen. Or it's an opportunity because they know nothing. Now is your chance to actually educate them and fill them with useful knowledge about why hydrogen should or should not be, be adopted. But I think whatever it is, it actually underscores the huge uncertainty with hydrogen because we're dealing with something that not many people have a lot of experience with. And that is both very promising, but also potentially problematic. And with that, I'm very happy to open it up for, for questions. Uh, Professor Bradshaw. Okay, many, many thanks for that. And we've got questions finally pouring in towards the end, having had them relatively few to start with. Okay. Um, one of the questions that was asked was around about the scale of, 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 of energy production that could come from, from hydrogen. And it would ties into the different shades of hydrogen. You didn't talk about the different colors of hydrogen and the notion of green hydrogen and how much, for example, might be available um, as a result of renewable generation. So Brian Richardson's saying is that uh, in Australia, the most, re most recent met metrics are that 25 tons of hydrogen can be produced every day via electrolysis. Um, and that is added to about 85 megawatts of solar power supplemented by 75 megawatts of wind generation. Different units there, which is always a bit of a nightmare. I guess the question was, you know, how much energy does that amount to, you know, say in the context of, of powering somewhere like Scotland? I mean, there's always this concern about the amount of energy that could be produced. No, absolutely. I think this is also the dualistic nature of hydrogen. It's not an energy source, it's an energy carrier. And so in markets or situations where you have excess energy or you have strong baseload facilities that don't have to peak, that aren't intermittent, that'll be sit there and produce energy. So hydropower, nuclear power, geothermal, maybe even some bioenergy, um, then yes, you can put excess energy into making hydrogen and that excess energy can do very wonderful things like fuel vehicles or you know, power fuel cells or even get stored in batteries. Uh, at the other hand, you need those types of sources of energy. And in many parts of the world, you don't have abundant energy. There are energy crises, especially in India or Sub-Saharan Africa where you don't have reliable sources of energy. And so there, if you're gonna promote hydrogen, it's gotta be made from something. And these are countries that have a hard enough time providing cook stoves and off-grid lighting. So I don't really see hydrogen playing a very big role in things like SDG seven, which is about universal energy access. So I think that it's kind of a, hydrogen has a lot of promise, but it's gonna be countries like Australia or the UK or Iceland or Germany potentially that use it and not uh, the developing world. And that's a bit unfortunate because I think it's the developing world that will see the greatest increases in expected energy demand and also the greatest increases in carbon emissions. And I think we're going to talk about this with Professor Overland's talk, but also the geopolitics of it are really interesting. Who will own the intellectual property for hydrogen? Uh, and how much will it actually shape very global patterns of trade or politics or prestige? So I think that while it's absolutely true that some countries could make blue hydrogen or green hydrogen, um, let's not also forget that others won't or can't, uh, and that it's also a very geopolitical question. Okay, there's, there are, there's a series of questions really around public acceptance, um, you know, in terms of, you know, you talked about a low level of energy literacy and un understanding of these issues more generally. You know, it's a suggestion perhaps that, you know, maybe one, maybe one way forward is, is via pilot projects that demonstrate the feasibility, um, but that then raises the question of who should be paying um, for uh, those pilot projects and, and more generally, you know, we, we talked about the dash for gas in the UK, but there was the cheap and abundant availability of natural gas. 
um, who gets behind the, the, the hydrogen campaign. So, you know, how do you get, you know, a greater visibility? How do you get public acceptance and who finances it? Well, really tough questions. Um, I can speak a little bit to some of our research. So we found in very particular innovations. So here it's not hydrogen, but some of our work on electric vehicles and solar panels, solar photovoltaics on homes is that one of the biggest predictors of adoption is familiarity and experience with it. So you've got to get the technology to a point where people can see it and use it. Uh, and this could actually lead towards more pilots, right? Or at least more programs where you go around and you teach people uh, and also have major campaigns. The town gas revolution that I mentioned had a major series of advertising campaigns because in a way, gas is a little scary and it's coming into the homes and people had to retrofit and change all their appliances as well. <clears throat> Uh, and there were things like some gas explosions and all of that. So I think that uh, both kind of pilot experiments and marketing are very useful. You can also do, so again, and not related to hydrogen, I have a study with a colleague, Scott Valentine, about Japanese nuclear power. And what was interesting there, I, I quite like the case study because it's very paradoxical. Most energy transitions are about managing technology. They're about getting its cost to a certain point, doing pilots, building up infrastructure, kind of a supply push. The Japanese project was about managing the public. So it focused entirely on manipulating the public to become more disposed towards adopting a very particular energy source. So most of their efforts, while they were of course part of Atoms for Peace and they did inherit a lot of technology from the United States, they put far more money into the marketing and far more money into the campaigning and far more money into the regulations. Uh, even Walt Disney had a cartoon called Our Friend the Atom which was then converted into Japanese and aired in Japan. So I think it's these types of kind of social campaigns that I have yet to see any of them for hydrogen um, at all. And I think while they aren't the only thing you need for adoption, you also need business markets and, and good policy mixes. I think that they would go a long way towards this issue of, of social acceptance. And I think that one of the other things that uh, you could potentially do uh, is, is better educate people about some of the harms of existing fossil fuels, because many people, especially those in the United States, still don't understand very well how much fossil fuels are killing them with air pollution and climate change and other threats. So I think it's a, it's a dual education, educating about the values of hydrogen and educating about the risks of our current energy system. Okay, there's, a, there's lots of questions coming in which are much broader around issues to do with just transitions and so forth, which are, I, I know are your, your sort of meat and drink. You won't have a problem addressing those, but I think we'd have a bit of mission drift if that were to happen. Sure. You know, one observation that has been made is that, you know, that, that all energy transitions involve a degree of, of regulation, state intervention, um, obligation and compulsion. You know, so I, I guess from my perspective, one of the questions there is it's about timing, you know, that we're, we are now at a point of, of various pilot projects being promoted, certainly in the UK around industrial clusters that involve hydrogen, carbon capture and storage. Um, we need to get on with this, you know, and, and given that the, I mean, we also know from lots of research we've all done that when governments tell people what to do, people don't trust what the government's saying. So how do we get out of this kind of conundrum? How do we build you know, confidence that no, the hydrogen story is, 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 is a viable solution because, of course, in the UK context, it comes with CCS. Yeah, I, I, don't, have the, I, I don't have the answer to that, to that question, but I think for me, it's acknowledging that hydrogen has, has benefits and drawbacks, not, not this kind of oversimplifying narrative that hydrogen is awesome, but also not this narrative that hydrogen is horrible. You know, I mean, Joe Rahm has a book called The Hype About Hydrogen, as if it's useless. I don't think it's useless. And I think there's a lot of potential for it in particular applications, especially industry, maybe mobility. I'm less convinced about mobility only because the, the very rapid rise of electrification as a substitutable fuel. But I think that kind of these overly simplified narratives don't do anyone a service. But I think a kind of a more balanced narrative that says hydrogen makes a lot of sense in these contexts, and these are the benefits, and here are the risks you have to avoid so we don't have poorly governed hydrogen systems um, would both not only increase its performance, but also its, its legitimacy. Uh, so I think that, that, that yeah, I think that's um, a more realistic grounding in science, which I know is not exactly the norm a lot of populations or publics are going in at the moment, but is the one that would serve hydrogen very well.
Okay, I mean, I say there are plenty of other questions and some of them quite complex and we've got about two minutes left. So I'm going to ask you a final question. Yes. You, you have the ear of Boris Johnson and you are going to make one request of him to, to get this whole hydrogen story moving. What would it be? See, the problem is that if I had the ear of Boris Johnson, the number one energy fuel I'd promote is energy efficiency. Absolutely. But you're not allowed to do yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Politicians I, don't like things that are not, you know, that are negatives. I mean, they want, you know, what are you going to do? You're going to, and you've got to, you know, you're going to build it up north, of course. So I would, I would probably urge him to push hydrogen for net zero industry. I think okay. that's probably the place that the UK needs the most. It's also a place the UK can lead. And it's already built into plans like the Industrial Decarbonization Research Fund. So I would say if you're going to spend your precious attention on hydrogen, industry first. Absolutely. And, and uh, you know, obviously there is evidence of that through the industrial cl clusters path line. And, and Laura Brown has actually applauded your choice of energy efficiency. <laughs> Correct answer. So on, on that point, many thanks, Benjamin. I think you know, if, if you know, spend some time just looking through the chat to, to, to see the other issues that are there uh, and join in. Um, so I'm, I'm conscious of time and the need to sort of get things moving again and turning to our second speaker. So uh, I think Indra needs to share his screen. <laughs> which he is now doing there. Okay, so you heard what Benjamin had to say. So it's, it's, it's your, your turn now, the, the floor is yours. Um, 30 minutes, yeah. presentations and questions. Thanks a lot, Mike and Ben. Um, I don't think I'm gonna say anything radically different really, uh, but maybe some, some nuances and, and some different topics. Um, what I'm gonna say is based on an article we recently published about the geopolitics of international governance of hydrogen, um, where we cast it as potentially the new oil, uh, but not necessarily. Uh, but I'm not only gonna base myself on that article, I'm, I'm also gonna bring in um, some points which kind of are the premise for the points we make in the article, especially in these first slides. So uh, Benjamin referred to, the, it's, to it being deja vu all over again. And I guess that's my starting point too, uh, in that uh, it's not the first time that we've heard about uh, hydrogen and that we've uh, heard very big ambitions for hydrogen. Um, and the, the last big wave of uh, enthusiasm about hydrogen um, ran into uh, several problems. So the challenge with uh, any energy transition component like this is you, you will very often have a kind of a chicken and egg problem. On the, on the one hand, you need somebody to start producing hydrogen and investing in that. On the other hand, you need people to start uh, investing in the equipment or infrastructure to start using it. So, so how do you get them started in, in parallel uh, from a very low base? Um, and actually with, with hydrogen, it's not just the producers and the users, uh, but it's also uh, the transportation the tanking stations and the cars, because in the past, this, this dream of the hydrogen economy was very much centered on, pub, on, on private vehicles. And for anybody trying to, to contribute in any of these four levels, there are very big risks. Um, you know, so you, you, you could invest a lot in producing hydrogen, but if nobody built the filling stations or bought the cars to use it, you wouldn't have many buyers or vice versa, you might buy a hydrogen car, but there might only be two filling stations in your country where you could tank up. Um, so you get, you get a, a whole series of parallel interlinked risks um, and actors have to act with perfect uh, synchronicity. Um, and this makes it frankly unrealistic. And that has been all along has been uh, Elon Musk's uh, point about Hydrogen. So his 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 bet on Tesla when he took over Tesla, and his bet on on uh, battery electric vehicles uh, is a bet against hydrogen. And so far, that's paid off very handsomely. Um, and the the announcements from Tesla, which were actually led to a fall in Tesla's um, share value about a, just over a month ago, uh, but are actually uh, quite uh, amazing. Um, and point to this bet against hydrogen for, uh, for cars being even more right than was previously presumed. So, so Tesla is prom promising us 
very major improvements in batteries and lithium ion batteries in the very near future. Reduced battery costs dramatically, um, increased range dramatically, in, uh, decreased use of energy for production of the batteries. Cobalt is already out of the batteries uh, that are being produced now, the new, new ones that are coming out now. Uh, and all of this is going to be available to customers in two to four years. And so far, Tesla has kept most of its promises in the past. Um, uh, and especially now that they've already started uh, the manufacturing on a small, small scale to begin with, um, this looks pretty good for battery electric vehicles and not very good for the old dream of uh, hydrogen um, vehicles. However, the, the situation is also changing if you look at this more broadly. So as we all know, um, there has been a dramatic rise uh, in variable renewable energy, uh, especially since 2010. Um, and this is expected to just continue. <clears throat> and this creates a new situation and some new challenges. Um, and one of the main aspects of, of the situation, uh, which we see especially well in Europe, because Europe has installed so much solar wind power so fast, um, is that prices are sometimes high, but often very low. And sometimes uh, they are even negative. So this graph just shows one example from Germany, France, France and Austria of a, a 20 year, a 20 hour period where, where those countries had uh, most of the time had negative electricity prices. So that would mean that the, the el electricity generators would pay wholesale buyers to take their electricity because they're bound by contract to produce it and they need buyers and there's just this too much electricity on the market. Um, and uh, this is one example there, uh, Norway where I'm based has had similar uh, experiences. Denmark has had similar experiences and so on. And we're, it's still early days. Um, there's, there's a lot more solar and wind power coming on uh, when offshore floating wind really starts taking off, which is likely to happen uh, quite soon. Uh, this is gonna increase even more. So this creates a whole new opportunity for uh, developing maybe not a hydrogen economy, as, you know, the whole economy centered on hydrogen, but at least a whole new uh, hydrogen sector. Because you no longer have all these very many different levels where actors have to take big financial risks uh, in parallel and make sure that everything is done synchron synchronously. Um, you can use hydrogen just to even out the spikes. So you can have, uh, renewable energy production here represented by the windmill and nearby large tanks for hydrogen. Um, and when uh, electricity demand or when there's an oversupply of electricity, uh, you produce more hydrogen, put it in the tanks. Um, when there is a lack of wind or sunshine, you turn the hydrogen back into electricity. Efficiencies with current technology are not that great. Uh, but you have to remember that this electricity is uh, virtually free or even negatively priced. Um, so it's a whole different starting point in that regard because you have all this cheap electricity um, and because you can fill a, fulfill a special task in smoothing the, the market, smoothing the grid. And uh, you don't need people to buy cars. You don't need people to build filling stations. You don't have to compress the hydrogen um, and you can keep it uh, like on this picture somewhere out in the field where there are not too many people around. So the, the danger from explosion is not that great. Um, that's very, very different from the previous uh, attempts to kickstart big scale hydrogen industry. But of course the, the evil battery people are still around and they've also been catching up. Um, uh, <clears throat> and there are, there, there is a, a increasing development of grid scale batteries. Um, so, so there is a race here, but the race this time uh, looks a lot uh, more fair and a lot more, um, a lot closer. Uh, and part of the picture is that um, since batteries won the transport race uh, many years ago, batteries are also very much needed there and are going to be needed more and more. 
we're going to see an incredible growth in electrical vehicles uh, in the next five years globally. Um, so it's not sure that, uh, that a battery is having that great market to go to, where demand is so great that uh, battery producers and EV producers can't even satisfy demand. And many people have to wait for a year or two in, in, in a queue, even paying for place in that queue just to get an EV. Um, it's not that sure that uh, grid scale batteries are really gonna be uh, competing that much against hydrogen as a grid storage solution. And then um, if hydrogen is successful in this area uh, of grid stabilization, temporal grid stabilization, then it will have the option to expand where, organically. Uh, not some grand plan. To, oh, we have some extra hydrogen here, which is stored uh, for, for smoothing of the grid. But in the meantime, if you could use some of that for uh, a very suitable purposes, uh, you may want to be buying that. Um, and probably first in line will be the, the, the industrial processes that need very high heat. Um, later on, perhaps aviation. And so uh, private vehicles might come very far down the line or they might never come. Uh, but it's a much safer or, uh, and less risky way to develop a hydrogen sector than what has been tried in the past. <clears throat> if um, this development is successful, if hydrogen grows vastly, from, hydrogen is already um, a big industry, but not green hydrogen. So if green hydrogen becomes a big industry, um, there are gonna be some countries that have comparative advantages. Um, and it's likely that we're gonna have a new international trade in hydrogen. Um, and uh, that means that we're gonna have shipping and shipping companies and shipping lanes. Um, we're gonna have some countries that produce more and export that are net exporters. We're gonna have some that are importers uh, that are net importers. We're gonna have political risks at both ends and along the way and so on and so forth. Uh, and what we try to describe in the article I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation is that if these things come true, hydrogen is gonna start looking quite a lot about like the new oil. Uh, it's gonna have some similarities. Although the way I've laid it out in the previous slides is not gonna be quite the same thing because it's not gonna be used at least initially for uh, as many different areas. So it's not gonna be as important for uh, as many types of transport. Um, but nonetheless, countries are beginning to wake up uh, to these possibilities and to the opportunities and to the possible threats that come alongside with all this. And it's amazing how many countries, including the EU, have published, uh, uh, have come out with strategies for the development of hydrogen and they're all talking about how they are going to gain the upper hand in the sector and how their, their uh, uh, industrial sector and, and their companies are going, to, uh, are going to try to take the lead in this area. So already we have uh, a type of uh, competition growing forth quite clearly. <clears throat> and uh, in another article, we looked at 204 publications about the geopolitics and the international affairs of the energy transition, which is a uh, a bigger literature than many people think. Uh, but what, one thing that was interesting is that there were, out of 204 publications that we reviewed, there were zero about the international politics of hydrogen. So this is really uh, an area where there are not certain, but possible consequences that almost nobody has looked into yet. It's received surprisingly little attention. So there is research to be done and there is international governance to be prepared and, and secured uh, to avoid some of the risks. And I saw in the, in the chat column uh, in this Zoom webinar that there were several questions about uh, carbon lock-in and about um, the risks involved. Um, and I think that's a very serious concern. Um, when we look at these, all these uh, country strategies um, for development of hydrogen economy and all the the, the immense enthusiasm that there has been on social media and in the media about hydrogen recently. And if you start scratching a little bit, um, it, you don't have to scratch much until you find an oil company, company somewhere there behind there. Uh, 
Hydrogen is already produced in large quantities, traded, uh, transported, and used, for example, in oil refineries. Um, so this is there are a lot of invested interests here. And although it's often the, the big visions are often colored green, in reality, most hydrogen today is not green. Um, so the, the risk of a carbon lock-in that we, we, we go for green hydrogen, but we end up with the uh, old fossil fuels based hydrogen is definitely there. And if you look at some of the, the most enthusiastic backers of this, um, that's quite a serious risk. Another major risk is uh, market fragmentation. So if, uh, if all of these countries uh, pursue their hydrogen strategies in isolation from each other, without cooperating with each other, we're not gonna get um, the kind of integrated global markets that have ben benefited uh, photovoltaic solar power, for example. Um, and we're not gonna get the kind of innovation, uh, competition-driven innovation uh, that has benefited uh, EVs and so on. So there's a, there's a need for integration, there's a need for synergies uh, and for, for uh, realizing synergies and identifying synergies, uh, and there's a need for working together. And finally, um, on the flip side, there's a, there's, if we do all of those things, there's, there's also a need to avoid geoeconomic rivalry, to avoid some countries trying to get a, a dominate, dominant position um, in this potentially uh, burgeoning hydrogen economy. And for all of this, we need more, um, more thinking aloud and more initiatives towards uh, some kind of international governance. Um, we have a lot of national strategies, but we don't have a lot of global strategies for hydrogen. Um, and one of the challenges, as so often in the energy area, is that the, the, the multilateral institutional landscape is very fragmented in the first place. So there is a need for, uh, perhaps for IRENA, the International Renewable Energy Agency, um, uh, perhaps for other bodies, to pick up the mantle uh, and uh, start working in this area. Having uh, pointed towards hydrogen as a possible uh, new oil of the future of international affairs, um, some caveats also based on another article uh, cited here at the bottom are perhaps also in place. And since gre green hydrogen is per definition based on renewable sources of energy, it has the, some of the same, its international affairs has some of the same uh, characteristics as other uh, um, renewable energy uh, industries. Uh, and one of the main characteristics is that countries have different resources. Some countries have a lot of sunshine and a lot of space uh, to put solar panels. For example, some other countries have a lot of hydropower or a lot of wind and a lot of sea to put floating uh, wind power in. Um, but, it, it, and in that regard, uh, renewable energy sources are similar to oil, um, but, there, but, but this similarity has its limits. So a lot of countries simply don't have any oil um, or have very, very little oil and gas. Whereas a few countries have a lot of oil and gas. So the, the, the resource, disparity, the difference between the haves and the have-nots uh, is much more dramatic in oil and gas than it is in hydrogen or in renewable energy, which is then the basis for green hydrogen. Um, and this means that some countries might have a geopolitical advantage, a geoeconomic advantage um, in the development of hydrogen. You know, for example, Saudi Arabia or uh, Algeria lots of space, lots of sunshine, and so on. Um, however, this is a comparative advantage, not an absolute advantage. So um, if you compare to the EU and Russia, the EU has been highly dependent upon uh, Russian uh -huh. gas, although that dependence has also sometimes been exaggerated, but there has been a very real dependence uh, because Russia has a lot of natural gas and the EU has had much less and it's been in decline. <clears throat> However, when it comes to sunshine, uh, the EU has less sunshine than some of its uh, southern neighbors, but it's not like the EU doesn't have any sunshine. So 
any country trying to uh, maximize its strength on the international stage by becoming a major uh, hydrogen producer and exporter shouldn't would, would be taking a very large risk by pushing its advantage too far because its customers are potentially its competitors for one. And second, uh, even if its customers might not want to uh, uh, start competing against it, producing their own hydrogen, um, there are very many other uh, potential exporters in the world. So it's more, there are more potential hydrogen exporters uh, than there are potential oil exporters. So this means that the geopolitical game can't play out as dramatically for green hydrogen as it has for oil. Because uh, everybody is a potential player on the producer side, even though it might make more sense to let some of the countries take the lead and produce the bulk of hydrogen. And on that caveat, and another little caveat on this picture, thanks for your attention. Okay, many thanks. Uh, questions have been coming in, um, and, and I guess trying to sort of summarize what what some of them are, are basically saying. I guess there's one of the themes that's appearing is this kind of this, you started off by talking about you know issues of risk, and that begs the question about whose shoulders are risk. You know, the the, the government, uh, industry, consumers. You know, it's if you think back to VHS and Betamax, you end up buying the wrong heating system. Um, you know, so, you know, so that that's an issue, but I think more generally, and there are comments about where this would work, where it wouldn't, is it seems to me that a, a whole systems approach to looking at the role of hydrogen, it's not hydrogen versus batteries, it's not, you know, it's, it's as I think as Laura Brown points out, it's probably all of the above. So there are areas in the energy transition where, where hydrogen offers a solution and other areas where it probably isn't the solution and it's identifying it at a whole systems perspective. But that so you know that raises this big question about you talk about people making decisions and doing this and that. Who comes back to the question for Benjamin? You know how do you get this to happen? You know in in, a, in market economies, it's the market that decides. So you know, how do you create a business model where consumers make an informed choice and hydrogen is part of the solution? You know how do you get from where we are to where we need to be? I think Benjamin made a very good point about uh, the um, about past energy, some transitions in the UK, uh, which I think is true several places. That sometimes uh, these things you do need some government involvement, and I think there's there's a difference here when you're going from um, from uh, from basically wood burning and burning oil lamps to coal power, for example. You don't really need that much government involvement because you have something that is, um, has so many advantages uh, that people are gonna adopt it based on a free market. But now we already have a very advanced energy system. Um, and I think to the reason to replace our old technologies are due to climate change. So we, it's, a, it's a different type of transition, a different type of game, and we need some kind of government involvement. Um, and we don't need just what the, the example that Benjamin was giving from within, within the UK, we need some kind of international coordination um, and some kind of international effort if we're, if we're gonna do this. Um, so I think it's really true that we need a whole systems approach um, and we need uh, some kind of international platform or institution for doing this. My suggestion is maybe IRENA, which I believe is generally gonna become a very, uh, international important multilateral institution in the in the future and which already has almost all of the countries in the world um, as its uh, among its members um, and which at one time when, when IRENA was founded um, seemed maybe like a kind of a niche like there's OPEC for oil and there's IRENA for renewable energy the point is that in the future all energy is going to be uh, renewable uh, IRENA has uh, basically global coverage in terms of its membership uh, so it is basically the world renewable, the world energy agency. Um, so, but there may be other platforms. It might be possible for a, a coalition of the willing to take the initiative. Um, it might be possible to do something in the UN and so on. Um, what I don't think though, is that it's, although we need a whole systems approach, we need some kind of collective effort, governments coming together um, to thought, to think and plan and look forwards and to also 
take actions to facilitate the positive development. Um, I, I do think there is a real competition between hydrogen and batteries. I think that's a that's a real thing. And I, I think as far as cars are concerned, I think uh, on the uh, on World Battery Day about a month ago, I, I think we had the last nail in the coffin for any competitor for the the battery electric vehicle. It's, it's really uh, dramatic what is happening. What is happening now with the, the increased range and lowered cost of batteries. Um, in other areas, I think it's much more open, but it's still uh, it's still a competition, um, and I think their markets maybe have a role to play, um, because I don't think um, anybody can predict which technology is going to win out. And by technology here, we mean not only the technologies we use, but also uh, uh, the, the consumers use, but also the technologies for manufacturing, which are very important for for the costs overall here. Okay, so you, you talked about the role that hydrogen could play as, as energy storage for intermittent renewables and how how it's storing that and then later generating electricity could deal with intermittency. But that's very much a in-day, between-day, short-term issue of balancing an electricity system. What about interseasonal storage? Because that, you know, if you look at the role, for example, that natural gas plays in many European energy systems, that winter heating demand and the, the ability to store huge amounts of, of energy in the summer months then to use in the winter. I mean, it's, you know, it's looking for those areas, those niches where hydrogen is the best solution. Can, I, can hydrogen offer a solution to that? Potentially, yes. Potentially, um, it, it, it could. You could have large storage facilities uh, for hydrogen. Um, and I don't know if they will be used for uh, only for daily balancing or for weekly or for monthly uh, or, for, or even for multiple months. Um, that depends on the on the competition, and it depends on how much you can handle by through interconnectors and expanding grids and maybe um, uh, uh, very long distance uh, grid solutions and so on. So the, obviously, the, the solution to variable renewable energy has has many components. Uh, part of which is how you build and manage grids. Uh, part of which might be grid scale batteries. Part of my, which might be things like pumped hydro. Um, but part of which may I may easily be hydrogen. It's the um, the only thing that I am sure about is that this is hydrogen's best shot at playing a big role outside the fossil fuels industry. Is the long term storage. I mean, and in response to that, Keith McLean has identified the possibility of, of importing hydrogen in the winter. And I think when I, when I read the the paper that you talked about natural gas at an earlier stage, I was in. I mean, the, the lesson to be learned from LNG about how you create or don't create markets, um, you know, and, and many and exporting countries involved in the LNG supply chain see a potential for hydrogen. You know that that creating an act global network is not straightforward. We don't have a global LNG market; we have regional markets. Mm -hmm. Indeed, indeed, there, there are plans now for first shipment from Australia to Japan of of hydrogen, but it's more as a kind of a, a gimmick or an experiment. Um, but there are, and there are in this area of, of international trade, there are also big um, technological questions hanging over it. Uh, so one of the very big questions, as far as Europe is concerned, but also for other parts of the world, is the is to what extent you can use uh, the, the pipelines for natural gas to transport hydrogen, um, and and to what extent you can uh, refurbish these pipelines, for example, by by uh, coating them on the inside. Um, to transport hydrogen, uh, because the problem with hydrogen is that it tends to make steel brittle, um, and in the end, you you can have accidents. Uh, but there may or, or or may not be at certain cost levels uh, the possibility of of, uh, of uh, fixing up those pipelines a little bit. And if that's possible, uh, uh, the answer to your question might be um, there's going to be huge trade in hydrogen through old pipeline networks. If this turns out to be very expensive, um, then there may be less trade. But of course, it also depends on tankers, which is the other option. Um, so there are there are many technological unknowns here that will play a role in how this plays out. Yeah, so one of the solutions at the moment through piloting is increasing the blend of hydrogen in the methane flow at the moment, getting up to 10, 10 from 10 to say 20 percent. That's a short term solution. And I know in the UK, and this would have been a question for Benjamin, I suppose, the, the, the gas networks have been through a process of steel replacement, replacing them with polypropylene pipelines at that at the local level. Um, you know, so 
and and that those those gas distribution companies are getting behind hydrogen to keep their networks in the business that longer term large diameter pipe issue i think is is a, is a different matter and it does raise a question that was raised actually earlier on in during benjamin's talk about you know there are material problems with hydrogen you know talked about in brittlement but also it's a smaller molecule it's propensity to leak and and, and so and you've got a picture of a, of a zeppelin exploding you know that all speaks to you know um public acceptance of hydrogen if that is the image that the public keep in their mind when you, you talk about hydrogen you know so I think what you know if, if we're trying to look at sort of some underlying themes here um, in terms of our discussion you know it's thinking about the place of hydrogen in the energy transition where is it best deployed in what industry is solving what energy service energy system problem you know and I think you're probably right that for light passenger vehicles hydrogen is not the answer but hydrogen is being looked at in trucking it's being looked at in trains and, and shipping and so forth so it may be there are different sectors of, of mobility hydrogen can contribute to you know and it's also thinking about okay so how does that fit into an energy strategy and the role of pilot projects and and trying to de-risk this system and then moving forward how do you create the necessary markets for transactions between producers and consumers? Those are the, you know, it's, those are the big questions, but it seems to me it's a, it's a debate where hydrogen has to be part of a much bigger conversation. And it, 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 it's quite siloed in some ways. And it's a bit like Marmite or Vegemite if you're in Australia. It seems to be one of those things that people like or dislike. You know? So I think perhaps it's through conversations like this that we can broaden out the agenda and I think that idea of understanding where hydrogen provides a solution, which is probably better than others or on a par with others and is available more locally, perhaps, I think is important. I guess that was a kind of a summation rather than a question, but if you have any final I, I comments Benjamin that either of like, you want to make. Yeah, Benjamin, Benjamin would like to say something, but I would also like to say something because the, the main thing I see is that all of these things, many of them, you can disagree, you can agree, you can invest or not, you can, the main niche I see is on this picture, if people can still see my screen, which is the, the, the hydrogen production plant and storage right next to or nearby a renewable energy production, production unit. So you have almost no distance in terms of transportation. Explosion blast is almost no problem. You don't need to compress it in a safe tank to drive around in a truck or a car. So I think the really important thing to see is to, to focus on now for anybody interested in hydrogen is this option is, is that happening or is it not? And then other things may or may not develop from there on. Benjamin, I'll give you the last word. No, I just, you just had me at Vegemite. Hydrogen <laughs> is the Vegemite of the energy system. Um, I was just gonna actually ask, I think that the kind of, the argument about affiliated infrastructure is a very important one. And I think with many of these transitions, there are a lot of hidden costs, right? With nuclear, the hidden cost of waste, with hydrogen, the hidden cost of network upgrading. And I was just curious, Mike or Indra, have either of you seen estimates for how much it would cost a country to upgrade its network to hydrogen? Are we talking millions, billions, trillions? I haven't seen such an estimate. No, but it's a very big number. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay, I think on, 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 that, that, on that point, I think maybe we will, uh, there was, there's more questions about materials and metal costs and so on and so forth. There's quite a lot of detail which we haven't been able to dive into in, in the narrative and we'll capture that and share that with everyone. Just to, just to confirm to everyone that this session has been recorded and will be made available um, certainly via Indra's uh, Institute site and UP site and hopefully the Unconventional Hydrocarbon site as will the presentations. Okay, so many thanks to both of our speakers for tackling a, a, a fascinating uh, issue, hydrogen, um, and, and from a variety of different angles, you know, but the socio-technical to the sort of geopolitical and, and global, global relations perspective. So I, I, I really enjoyed the session. Thank you everyone for your questions. Um, hopefully we've gone, we've gone some way to providing some answers and promoting further discussion. I mean, hydrogen is very much in vogue at the moment. It's not, in that sense, it's not like Vegemite. Um, everybody's talking about it. Um, so I'm sure we'll come back to discuss these issues at a later date. So I, I wish you all uh, a very good rest of the day. Take care and stay, stay safe. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks, Mike. And thanks to Liz for organizing. Yeah, thank, thank you, Liz. You.